appears the signal came too early. Uh, please bear with us. Now for a few seconds, you can take your seats. We, we may rise finally. Some people want to sing. It's okay, you can sing. Um, <laughs> I think, have a seat, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Your Excellency, former President of the Republic of South Africa and Chancellor of the University of South Africa, the Principal and Vice-Chancellor, Professor Lenkabula, the Executive Dean of the Tabumbeki African School of Public and International Affairs, Professor Vilm Komo, members of council, members of executive management present here, members of the UNISA staff and students, distinguished guests and your excellencies presence here from all ambassadors good afternoon Dumela Madame Monsieur Bon Après-midi Jambo Habarizenu Molweni I'm getting good eh 
Well, talk to your neighbor and say you look good. Yes. They do look good, aren't they? And tell them they are privileged to be here. It is an honor, indeed a privilege, for me to be your program director. My names are Esther Kibuka Sebitosi. Just repeat that. Welcome to the country known as the Pearl of Africa. Which country is that? Put up your hand. We shall give you a present. <laughs> Nobody knows. Uganda. Hey, that's good. So I am from Uganda, and His Excellency, who is our patron in the school, is really very Pan-African, isn't it? So it's such a privilege for us to have him here to seek his wisdom. If I was going to put any title to these conversations, I'll call it in search of wisdom. Why do you search wisdom? Because there's so much information you are getting from your tablet, from the radio, from television. So you're getting a lot of fake news. That is information. You have to turn that into knowledge. Knowledge is what you read, what you hear, but then the important thing is the wisdom. So the wisdom we are getting from His Excellency and the other speakers. What is wisdom? The wisdom is not just knowledge you've got from the books, but the application, the ability to apply that knowledge. What are the ways of getting wisdom? Long time ago, the Queen of Sheba went to King Solomon and she took a lot of gold and spices to seek the wisdom of King Solomon. King Solomon had prayed for wisdom. So ladies were always rich, weren't we? She took gold and spices to get the wisdom. And it is recorded that she asked him many questions. So this afternoon, you have got the opportunity to ask many questions questions to His Excellency. Clap your hands right there. And Solomon had prayed for wisdom. The other ways of getting wisdom is sitting at the feet of experienced people. That is what they call learnerships. Many do it in entrepreneurship. I have a PhD student in Ghana where the main mode of learning is that they give an expert and you come and learn. So this afternoon, we are privileged indeed to learn from His Excellency, from our VC, and from other speakers you're going to hear. Let me not waste a lot of time because these moments are very, very precious. So when you're asking these questions, please take note that you are seeking for wisdom, not information. Mm -hmm. Have you got that? Yes. I now have the pleasure of introducing our own Professor Lenka Bula, the South African Club. <laughs> you already know her as the principal and vice chancellor of UNISA. The CV is too long, I'm not going to bother reading it, please Google it, because she's a woman of substance, a great leader, she's an activist in social justice, in gender, and everything. We are so privileged because she was the first woman to be appointed the principal and vice chancellor of UNISA. Please give the South African welcome. Thank you, Program Director. Dumelang, Sandvanan, Moloen. Good afternoon. President Tabon Beki, the Chancellor of the University of South Africa and the patron of TM School. 
we're truly elated that you have made time to engage with us. Members of Council and Executive Management of the University, I recognize Ms. Nagena amongst members of the Executive, Professor Vil Gomo, the Executive Dean of TM African School of Public and International Affairs, as well as Professor Magwe, the Executive Dean of the College of Education. Professor Zetu Kakata, Dr. Powe, Mr. David Lezualo, and all esteemed guests, members of the Diplomatic Corps, students, academics, and professional staff of the University of South Africa, and all guests here to celebrate and engage this great icon of South Africa in the continent, one who has not been afraid to naming, but also appealing to our social consciousness to transforming lives for our society in the global arena between north-south as well as in the continent, not to go with a begging bowl in the global arena. These are very important ideas about ethical agency and moral agency. I'd like to welcome you to the University of South Africa, the University of Leaders, Professor, uh, the patron, is also an alumnus of this university. So if you're looking towards being a president at some point, <laughs> <laughs> try to do your best. This is the place where leaders are formed. No, uh, I'm honest. President Mandela, the current president, President Aristide, all of them have gone through the shores of UNESCO. I'd like you to welcome you to this august event, an engagement with the Chancellor, the patron of the TM School, the former President of the Republic of South Africa, and our Chancellor. I appreciate the opportunity that as we celebrate 150 years of UNISA's existence, the inventor of comprehensive open education at the level of university, that you have joined us in the first celebratory engagement with our Chancellor, President Mbeki. I think this one deserves a round of applause. It requires a round of applause because this is an example of how Africa can initiate and invent systems that are generally resourceful in the formation of individual, in the development of economies and systems, but also in creating access and success to education. No university before UNISA had that. But UNISA is also the founding institute for the university system in South Africa. And therefore, we should at all times not negate the asset, this asset of society and the mission it has to play. I want to say, uh, President Becky, the first time I participated in your engagement with the students, I was quite uh, peeved. It was the investment seminar, the first one, when you were starting the Tabo Mbeki Foundation and Timali. At the time, I was one of the lecturers that were at the center of supporting this particular mission. And I vividly remember the call that you made around if Africa does not invest in its people, but also in its economies and institutions, then we would not move anywhere. And I still think this is an important arena. It's okay, you can. <laughs> My excitement is also, uh, Chancellor, is also about the fact that you have not been afraid of encouraging the world of ideas and contestations of ideas, even in the seat you held as a president of this country. You were worried about the identities of Africans, their spiritualities, civilizations, but also contribution to the global arena. You invited all of us to rethinking around the transformations and the renaissance or revolutions that required the geopolitical ideas economic ideas, and the social imperatives for positioning politics, economies, 
for the new millennium. And a critical importance of change was, was quite something that we still have to really reimagine the renaissance and the revolutions required if our continent is to have citizens that live with dignity and if our institutions will be resourceful to our societies but also to the global arena. Colleagues, we must never forget how President Becky led a 10-member high-level panel on the, uh, of the African Union in the war against illicit financial flows from the continent. These fundamental issues concerning the socio-economic and political advancement of Africa are still potent question that we are grappling with in the current context, even here at home. Chancellor Mbeki also declared during a Youth Day rally that as a society and government, we must continue to forge broad youth front for the reconstruction and development, placing at its center the active participation of citizens and youth and young adults as their own liberators from the yoke of social deprivation. These are quite important insights that we should, as we think about engaging, think seriously about them. But you didn't just talk about this, President Mbeki. You ensured that the strengthening of organizations that support youth development, such as the National Youth Commission, Umsobombu Youth Fund, and the South African Youth Council were one of the programmatic priorities that enabled the youth and young adults to learning from leaders such as yourself and to prioritizing their communities. And when you spoke at the Youth Day event in 2008, Chancellor, you recognized the importance of South African youth by pointing out that the country's freedom today is the result of the youth past sacrifices. And, and youth must never forget that. When we have disruptions in our society and decimation of systems, institutions, but even of each other, we should remember that particular call you made, that the youth should work in collaboration with society and with the government to ensure that the opportunities and benefits of democracy bear fruit. You urge the government to prioritize the task of developing and empowering or giving the center stage to women who are talented, who can ensure that they improve the participation of South Africa in the world. Your, your, your cabinet and the parliament at the time demonstrated women of substance who were committed to ensuring that uh, graft was not normalized or normative, but that the social justice agenda is rolled out. This is quite important because for us as universities, we need to think around how Africa's universities contribute and partner with society to alleviate poverty, to resolve, and to ensure the best use of resources of the continent for the benefit of our society. And yet the African higher education research agenda tends to focus purely on academic and scientific objectives in order to ensure publications in refereed journals and not necessarily engage scholarship. And this is an area that UNISA, as it celebrates 150 years, has pivoted engaged scholarship as an important arena and horizon of change. We've also thought that research and education must be conducted in relevant environments where we respect the resources of indigenous and endogenous knowledge systems that we draw from our societies. Finally, colleagues, I want to just remind you that in 2010, the Tabo Mbeki African Leadership Institute, Timali, was launched through the International Academic Conference that I referred to. In November 2019, the council approved the establishment of the new school which met Timali uh, Institute for Dispute Resolution African Renaissance and the Tabo Mbeki School of Diploma, which resulted into the TM School of 
African diplomacy, governance, state affairs in Africa. We also later added the School of Governance to the new school. In 2020, officially changed Timali from, we officially changed from Timali to the Tabo Mbeki School for Public and International Affairs, which is a fully pledged school with an executive dean, Professor Ngomo. Colleagues, if you have not registered, you still have a chance. <laughs> we cannot allow you not to take this opportunity. Learning from our sources. Let's not forget the imperative of drawing lessons from our own wells, as the feminist scholars remind us. Oftentimes, the name that President Becky has bequeathed to us as the University of South Africa, the archival materials, over 187 themes that are important for following up as a university have become important sites of encouraging us, to, encouraging us students to being active agents in societal change. Positive conversations and discussions with potential national and global partners, collaborations with academics, think tanks, embassies, as well as multilateral organizations such as African Development Bank, the Council for the Development of Social Sciences Research in Africa have become areas of interface with the TM School. I welcome you to the university. I hope you'll have the best engagements and I'm appreciative that President Mbeki is willing to answer and engage on anything and everything that your heart would, would like to engage on. Welcome, thank you. Please give our cha Vice Chancellor another Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we are going to hear from the Executive Dean, Professor Vilm Komo, who also introduced the Chancellor. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor. And again, welcome, Mr. President. Uh, Madam Vice Chancellor, this university is celebrating its 150th, 50th year of existence. It's quite a milestone. It's a milestone also because this particular conversation is taking place when the university is celebrating its existence. So Mr. President, we're honored that you are available to celebrate with us as chancellor, as patron of the school, the 150 years of existence of the University of South Africa. We're happy about that. And we're also happy that the Tabo Mbeki Foundation is also in recognition of this major achievement by the University of South Africa. I will be very brief. The Vice Chancellor has actually given you some of the key points of who President Mbeki is. I will quickly run through a few myself because it's important that we encourage young people in particular, to think about building, to think about being constructive, wanting to create societies at work. I've asked the president to actually refer to a few points without digging into his CV because you never introduce a president by reading their CV. It's a no-no but I will just point out a few points. He gave me permi permission to do so. Mr. President, you have distinguished yourself as President of South Africa. 
there is no doubt that we benefited a lot from your leadership. We miss you and we hope. <laughs> We hope that other leaders will learn from you and want to be like you. You played a critical role in the transformation of our country into a democracy. Senegal, where you met with the adversaries and progressives who wanted to change South Africa. You had no fear but determination. You were very much involved in making sure that this transition is a smooth one, not a bloody one. And it turned out to be a smooth transition. Anybody who calls for violence is not worth it. This democracy we are enjoying today many are taking for granted. They don't realize that this democracy was had hard end through negotiations, multi-party negotiations, and also mobilizing the international community to support our wish to have a democratic country. You served the ANC with conviction. You were very clear that the African National Congress must stand for the correct values of how to build a new society. So I want to celebrate you and say we are very happy that you are a patron of the school and we are transmitting those values to the students. In the international arena, you were all over Europe, the United Nations, the African Union, making significant contributions to making sure that South Africa survives. And we should appreciate that and not take it for granted. Intellectual, I wrote an article about you asked by Chester Crocker, and one of the points I underscored was your intellectual abilities and the fact that you are also an economist. We now know why our economy was flourishing during your time. Peacemaker in the continent and peacemaker also globally. You are a man of peace a person who has been able to engage with the world to ask for a peaceful resolution to conflict. And that's what this world wants. The Renaissance is your cry and call to have Africa to be reborn and let Africa take its responsibility on its shoulders and take this continent forward. The University of South Africa, as the Vice Chancellor stated, is, highly, is highly honored to have you as the Vice Chancellor. You are a role model and will continue to celebrate you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. You take over now so that we can move on with the program. Thank you very much, Professor Vilm Como. As we prepare and set the tone for the questions that you are going to ask His Excellency, we have got some remarks from our esteemed academics right here at UNISA and one from Vit, Vit. I'll not try to say Vit Votasland. No, I'll not. But what I know is that what this conversation is ha happening at a very opportune time. When you look at the geopolitics, the shift, 
when you look at the technology, the 4IR is here. When you look at the social dynamics, not only uh, people fed up and they're saying, hey, we want action, we want service, but also the challenges we are facing like water and energy, when you look at the environment, the climate change happening, we as biologists have been telling you guys about climate change. No, 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 you wouldn't hear until now. So we are very happy that now the agenda for climate change is happening and also the legal dynamics are happening. So when you think about that complex situation, you really need to think hard, very, very hard to find solutions. I now have got the privilege of inviting three esteemed academics to give us just a brief teaser, if you might say. I want to start with Professor Zedu, Zetu Kakala. Is that right? <laughs> I'm trying my best, but soon. She is a full professor. Come up as I introduce you, please. She is a full professor in the Department of Psychology at UNISA. She has done a lot of work in the indigenous knowledge systems and ways of understanding human science psychology. She is working on the re-Africanization of the curriculum through language. Give her clap right there. And she's published so widely, extensively, about names and practices, and so on and so forth. Please use the Google you allowed. To the Chancellor, uh, Vice Chancellor, the Executive Dean of the TM School, members of management, colleagues, students, and the distinguished guest, Diane Bullis. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chancellor, for the sacrifices you made for our freedom. Of all the freedoms, I have particularly enjoyed that of writing what I like. Dear members of the audience, I am deliberate about choosing to appreciate the freedoms that I do have. My mom and dad last night told me that today is not the day to focus on what you do not have. I shall therefore speak as a child whose parents went to war for freedom. A child who comes from parents who wouldn't tolerate oppression. A child who comes from love because to be fought for is to be loved immensely. When I was invited to speak here on Global Matters, my mind traveled back to the 1980s in primary school. That is my age. <laughs> I was taken back to the athletics grounds where the teacher would explain the rule of the race, the rules of the race, be it 400 meters or the 100 meter meters. And my favorite part was when, the, when, when the, were those children whose first brain would tell them to find shortcuts to the finishing line. As we know, they would be subjected to a lot of corrections for not grasping the rules of the game. That is how I've been feeling about global matters. Sometimes it appears that our role is predetermined, that the stage is, is always set for us. Professor Ngurin Zengu writes about this, about this world that's founded on the principles of game theory. Those in the academic sphere often speak of this complex arrangement using various labels, as you know. Labels such as geopolitics, the global matrix of power, coloniality of power, and many others. Referring to an apparent up upper hand, certain nations have over others. That seems hard to disrupt. 
what are these United Nations that could easily be responsible for both peace and war? The United Nations that can wage wars, but also be tasked for the restoration of peace. What is war? Professor Ramos laments on this paradox of the concept of a just war. We arrived at these questions because we come from a different value system. As Professor Somato Figeni once said, right at this very venue, that our parents fought for this country because the imposed value system was not congruent with how we know life. We are just emerging from a situation of, of global health right now, where many could not even determine the cause of their well-being. As it was said earlier, I come from psychology, from an indigenous African psychology. I therefore concern, I am therefore concerned with the healing of the human. I am interested in the kind of psych that produces this human behind the kind of international and global affairs to which we have been subjected. What causes such a commitment to violence and disruption? What could be, what could be lacking or what is in excess in the makeup of those who commit such acts? These infantile responses to discerning vo voices and the paternalistic impulse when dealing with those such acts have impacted. It is worth asking again, what is war? That nations could sit in a general assembly to vote whether country A should bomb country B. What is the psychology of a people who perceive that as sensible? Thank you very much. Mr. Chancellor, I brought you gifts. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> One of those is poetry, poetry. I didn't know you were a poet. I would have, you know, loved to have you. Please give another round of applause. <laughs> so it's not only the Queen of Sheba that gave the king a present. You gave presents. Wow. Thank you very much. And please go get her books. They're available on Amazon. Yes. Home, the available home. Okay, please talk to her afterwards. And um, thank you so much. I would now like to um, introduce one of our own professors. I love this lady. She is the acting executive dean of the College of Education. She's NRF rated very, very highly. And she specializes in open distance e-learning, that is ODEL research. If you've not attended one of her workshops, run and run very fast because they are really fantastic. I've been attending them and you can write and write about ODEL really very well. She has worked with international bodies like UNESCO and the Commonwealth of Learning. Please help me welcome Professor Makwe Bine. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you, um, Your Excellency, the former President of the Republic of South Africa, um, Mr. Tabumbeki, the Vice Chancellor of UNISA, Professor Linkabula, the Executive Dean of the Tabumbeki African School of Public and International Affairs. I'm still used to Timali, so I'm getting there slowly. I've been around for a long time. We called it Timali then. Now it's Tawumbeke African School. I like that. Thank you. And um, it is really an honor to be in front of these distinguished guests, students, colleagues, 
uh, the management of the, of the university here present. Thank you so much for this opportunity to come and, and speak. When I was invited, I wasn't sure what this is all about. I thought we are celebrating 150 years. And I'm going to talk about that because that I'm very confident with. So today, we are celebrating today and we are celebrating for the whole year. There'll be lots and lots and lots of celebrations as we celebrate 150 years. You can't have one day for that. Um, this university has been around for years and it has been around for 150 years shaping futures, ensuring that people who do not have access to higher education do have access to higher education, ensuring that doors are opened for you and me. You know for a fact that if it wasn't for the education system that this university provided, none of us would be here. Many of us are first generation, not only in our own households, but in the community, in the whole village. You are first generation. Back in the day, when you were graduating, the whole village would slaughter a cow and make sure that, and welcome you as, a, as, a, as one of us who has gone and came back. When you are flying, going to somewhere to a different country, every village, all of us, would go to the airport to see you off. Things have changed and I don't know why. And probably that's why the, 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 the line, the tagline for celebrating our 150 is to reclaim our Africa's intellectual futures. Those people, we didn't call them intellectuals, but they were human. They were intellectuals in terms of how they related to one another. A child was not a child, because of themselves. They were child because you, were, you belong to the collective. <laughs> now, how do we reclaim? Reclaim means to recover something that we have lost. And that's why I started with this story. We have lost who we are. And the minute you lose who you are, Every other person will come in and tell you what they want you to become. And before you know it, you don't even know who you are anymore. You can't identify with who you are. We work and we live in places that are not us. Not ours, but not us. And we try, we, we live such a schizophrenic life that sometimes we find that in these spaces where we find ourselves in, it's the place where we should be. Whereas you do not become who you are in that space to make the change that you want. As we reclaim this Africa, we need to think about intellectual futures. One of the things that I have passion about, and it's now lately, that I have passion, maybe it's my old age as well, is to try and shape what the futures of others, of Africans should look like. We cannot continue with other people's futures. And I call it futures because it's not monolithic, it's not only one future. We cannot afford to continue to have the future that everybody else has. We need to give this country the hope that we wish for. This university, in its creation, was to help people to achieve the dream that they want. Ours is a business of hope. When you start, when you decide to go to university, you already have it in your mind. When I have a PhD student and we have our initial conversation, the first thing that I ask them is, when, when are you planning to graduate? And then they will go all over the place because they never thought of that. They only think about, now I'm starting. Now today, colleagues, I am trying to ask you to think, what is it that you want to achieve at the end of it all? Not now, not tomorrow, not 10 years from now, I'm in the education department. I'm in the education, the College of Education. 
the teacher that I teach in that college, the one who is enrolled in 2023, is going to be in the classroom in 20, uh, 2027, 2028, but definitely in 2030, she or he will be in the classroom. And the hope that, that I give to this person today will have an impact to a child that they will be teaching in 2027 or 2030. And that child will get that hope and take it forward to 2050. So whatever that we do, it's not for us. That is why a village will come and celebrate with you when you graduate, because they understood that what you bring in this village, it's not for you, it's for us. So as you are going to be communicating with um, the village today, because when you look at people as big as it's the whole village, uh, try to, you know, eat from those words of wisdom. Take what you can take. Bring back the humanness. Bring back the village in this community. And let's work together to give this country hope that we desperately need. Thank you. Please give her another clap. <laughs> you know, as I was listening to her, I just remembered in my family, I was the first person to graduate with a degree. Imagine. And on the village, the whole village, by the way, so the church, <laughs> you know, my father was a pastor. I think you can see the anointing here of the pastor. <laughs> Hallelujah. So <laughs> the whole church was invited for the graduation party. So, and remember the values of Yunisa, Ye Ubuntu, you know? I am because you are. And we have got, you remember the 12 C's? Plus two, I added two, because I added one. I want to add another one, you see. I think that we should be who we are as Africans. That's why we call our school the Tabumbeki African School of Public and International Affairs. And it is so interesting because our vision is to create an African global and futuristic school of public and international affairs. Futuristic. Why futuristic? Because what you're doing now is for the future. And our mission is to educate leaders who solve complex problems. So ladies and gentlemen, as we think through that, I hope you've got this brochure because these are the courses we're offering. Come on, come on, come on, register, register, register. I don't have to go through them because they're all here. At this point, I would like to invite the son of the soil, Dr. T.K. Poe. Dr. Poe is from Wits, and he's a senior lecturer at the School of Governance. He teaches, he supervises, he does research on a very interesting topic, state owned enterprises. I don't know how he does that, but the stage is yours, Dr. Poe. Please give him a hand. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, do my name the guy? I, I'm not great with the protocol thing, so everything the two guests and the speak and the and then I think the director have said, I copy paste reference protocol of Z, so we're done. <laughs> Good. Uh, mine is actually quite a simple one, I think. I've, I was asked to say, listen, give us maybe a state of the republic in relation to what we're doing. And uh, I thought, okay, now that's quite a simple task, really. I mean, South Africa, what's complicated about the republic? <laughs> yeah, so as I speak, I hope the lights will stay on. <laughs> Topic number one. <laughs> but, uh, uh, look, uh, I said, look, let me maybe do, do this a bit differently. And I think Three songs, I think, kind of capture the mood of the Republic currently. And uh, I think as a, uh, I think the program director said, please uh, use Google for some of the things I'm going to say. 
I think the first one is uh, Winston Mankoki Ngozi's song, Yakala Nkomo. Uh, for those of you that are under the age of a certain thing, I think you will need, you will need Google. It's jazz, you know, it's not, <laughs> what is the Pretoria thing here, which I have a dislike for? Uh, that music, it's not music. <laughs> Whatever they call it in Pretoria, I don't like it. <laughs> Look, uh, you know, for, for those that we actually have the privilege of uh, that album, that first song, when you hear it, that long, uh, it speaks about, in the generation previous, about when you slaughter that cow and the noise it makes, that painful, slow death. And when you look at the state of the republic, it's not really, I'm not stretching it to say, we kind of feel like in a state of slow death. I come from uh, Everton in the Val Triangle. To go home now is almost like going home previously. I appreciate the efforts that have been made, but when you go home and see friends and people you studied with still looking for employment, and I think it's about 15 million using stats they say from last year, it tells us that something is broken. When we have to be told that we are no longer aspiring to be a developmental state, but a capable state, which is an oxymoron, because to be a developmental state is to automatically be capable it says, Yakala and Gom. Now, the second song I think which sort of speaks as well to where we are is For the Lovers in the House, Teddy Pettengrass's The Whole Town is Laughing at Me. As I said, you're going to need Google for some of you guys here. <laughs> when you listen to the song, it says, and obviously I'm going to take the liberties as how I interpret it, it speaks about having something of treasure and worth but when it was in your presence, you didn't take care of it. And now the whole town is laughing at you. The state of the republic, this once glorious republic, people are laughing at us. Uh, I'm glad to see the, because I'm not, he's not laughing at us, he's a friend, uh, the ambassador of Singapore, so I know it's good to see you here. But when you speak to other people, not from the republic, even on the continent, you have to understand how they view it. They say this country has so much potential. I mean, I can guarantee you the oddity, this is one of the weirdest things about South Africa. Everywhere else in the world, when you develop an economy, you start on the coastline, right? You think London, you think New York, right? Mombasa. South Africa is unique in that our economy is central. You think Johannesburg, you think Pretoria. That is unique because our climate is just absolutely is brilliant. You go anywhere else in the world, South Africans excel, black or white. That is why companies want to hire South Africans. Because when you go through our education system, as maligned as it is sometimes, there's certain things I know we still have to fix. But it surely is an oddity that it can be maligned, it can produce CEOs who are working overseas. So it says something is not right. But then it comes back to the fact that how is it that people are laughing at us? Because they're saying, how can you have such beautiful potential in this country, yet it's not moving? Now, the third song is a bit of an odd one in that while we have great st our institutions really are under great duress, and I think most importantly, the field I look at, scenario planning, I think the number one thing which is kind of missing, and I happen to have the privilege of being in the Northern Cape this week, and I was speaking to a colleague from the HSRC, he said something which kind of hit me now when we're speaking, which is, what happened to the great ideas? When you had the privilege, remember, I can, one, I can truly say I'm one of those people who had the privilege of seeing Bafana Bafana at its apex, as in, I could remember seeing us winning AFCON. I can remember us going to finals. Spring box, right? Do you understand that 2024 20, is gonna be, a, a child will be, the child who was born then is gonna be 30 years of age. Their understanding of the Republic is disaster. I think, what are the words, I think there's words uh, young people use now, we're going through the most, I think is the word they use, right? Uh, but then it says to me that, what happened to imagination? Now, I know our, our president is a fan of Shakespeare, so I'm going to take the liberties to reinterpret Shakespeare as I do, which is, I think, when uh, Mark Antony went to the death of uh, Julius Caesar, and I'm not saying anyone is dying, because I know we take dying very seriously in Africa, <laughs> so I'm not causing death on anyone. But, you know, he said something, I've not come to praise Caesar, but to bury him. And in a way, I, I take a disjuncture a bit, which is to say, I am thankful for what the previous generation has done. We should always honor that. Because if you look at all other nations in the world, oh, you can touch on that. Yeah. <laughs> but when you look at all other nations in the world, as, as I think the previous speakers have touched on, 
Yes, the Jews will remember Moses, the Christians will remember those people, and all other nations, it's good to remember. But once remembrance becomes a cage for our imagination of the future, ladies and gentlemen, we have a problem. So I am thankful, but we need to be better. I remember, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say, Mr. President, that during those times, people were asking when the previous president, the first president was leaving, what's going to happen, what's going to happen? And the one thing I always remember about President Baker is the confidence he showed that things are going to be fine. It's amazing that he had no qualms about who he was taking over from someone like President Mandela. Yet many of us are sitting here and are afraid to take over from people we know are failing. <laughs> people are failing. So as I speak about the third song, and you notice I have not named the song, I want to say I praise the past. I'm thankful for the past, but it's time for us to write our own song. Because in between Yakala and Komu, in between the whole town is laughing at me, something beautiful can come out of this. I have the privilege again of being in education, and you get to see people whose ideas are there. I know our civil servants are much maligned, but there are brilliant civil servants in this country who are working their behinds off in this country. We have an amazing private sector when it wants to work. We have like I say, I, I, I always say this when people say, what is your hope? Because sometimes, you know, when people give analysis on TV, we're called the prophets of doom. A and I say, look, my hope is that I remember when things worked in this country when we had leadership. So it's not really a misnomer for me to say, with the minute we have leadership, this country will move. So I leave you with that, which is we are creating our own song now. Thank you. Give him another clap. <laughs> Create our own song. Mm, there's a song I like. Show, show, lose <laughs> Come on. Show, show, lose Give yourself a clap. Well, 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 the time has come now for the long-awaited questions. Please, don't be like professors who give the background. <laughs> you know the background? And whereas, even if, therefore, you understand? Ask your question. Don't give us the background. Simply ask the question. I think you've got the context, right? Simply ask the question and keep it short. We are going to give you 30 seconds to pose your question. If it is too long, I'm going to say, you keep quiet and sit down with plenty of respect, OK? OK. I'm going to ask five people from this side for the first round, and then we shall have another five second round. And if time allows, we shall have a third round. Is that okay with you? Okay, let me have the first hands. And please identify who you are. We want to know who you are. And use the mic, the mics, Press and speak. You put your hand up first, number one. Number two, the young man there. Okay, number three, number four, number five, the yellow shirt. I'm done with this side. Then I'll go the other side. Okay, identify yourself. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Mr. President. The name is Anele Sitao an alumni of Timali. Um, I just want uh, your views, Mr. President, on the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Um, I'm asking because uh, of there was uh, before it uh, the Lagos Plan of Action, 
where African countries made certain concessions, but uh, when they had to effect those concessions, which among them were going to cost their countries uh, revenue, then they re resisted uh, effecting uh, those uh, concessions. I believe there might be such concessions even in the African Continental Free Trade Agreement area. So I just would like your views how the effecting of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement is going to be different from the effecting maybe of the Lagos Plan of Action. Thank you. Next. Uh, my, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. My name is uh, Tavi Somtembo. Mr. President, um, what would you actually advise someone who's aspiring to be the president of South Africa? And uh, again, personally, how was it for you as the president of the country? And going further, um, uh, in terms of the ANC's um, document of uh, Through the Eye of the Nigel, which states uh, how uh, leaders are supposed to be, how do you think the ANC can make it a document that is... Uh, that moves from being a paper document but becomes something that is a reality and actually something that is implementable at the end. And uh, Mr. President, lastly, my, my question is, what do you think about uh, the, public, the acting public protector's uh, uh, report on, on Palapala saying that uh, the president was uh, actually, there's nothing wrong there or some, or, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, I almost did, okay. The third, was it you? Yes. we leverage on that foresight who told us Thank you. Number four was, it was you, yes? No. Introduce yourself, please. No, I was Mic. Colleagues, if, um, if you spoke first, please switch off the mic because the next person can't speak. Okay. 171. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, this is Thabo Mtsweni from Democracy in Action. Uh, Mr. President, my first question to you, uh, as the chairperson, as, as you were chairperson before of illicit financial flows, uh, I would really love your comment on the grey listing that uh, as South Africa we currently have now. Uh, I think coupled with that will be 
uh, with the dollars or millions and billions of dollars that will stay somewhere in the farm in Limpopo and how is that affecting South Africa? So that will be my first question. My second question, what will be your comment on the current uh, public protector that is facing a disciplinary action by the uh, chairperson or well by the parliament section 194 committee currently going on and yeah what is your comment on that thank you thank you and lastly the one in yellow switch on your mic we see if it's working yes continue okay <clears throat> uh, thank you very much program director and uh, our former president, thank you very much. And uh, without wasting any time, my name is Johannes Mashaba. I'm a Timali student, and I work in one of the national department. My question is, maybe let me tell you the name of my song, uh, taking the cue from the previous speaker. When everything is dying, what do we do? I'm raising this in the context of, as the country, I think everybody now has accepted that we have got a challenge of leadership in organizations. And uh, corruption, is tearing our organizations apart. The focus currently is on political leaders that have corrupt, but there is something that I think we are missing. Government department are led by ministers, DG, DDGs, and you go on downwards. And uh, if the minister who's responsible for that department is fast asleep, the DG's hands are used to be in the cookie jars. Those that he appoints, obviously, you can't appoint a person who does not think like you. Now, what can we do as people who realize that things are happening in a particular department. And when everything is dying, I'm saying you go there to report corruption, you find incapable people. You go there and report corruption, you find people who seem to be deaf. You go there and report corruption, you find people who are connected to those people whose hands are in the cookie jar. So what should we do in order to correct this situation? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I would now like to call upon His Excellency to come and answer. Give him a clap, please. Okay, I'll come back. I, I hope this is working. It is okay. No, thanks. Thanks a lot for the for the questions. But Dr. Poe, uh, I you heard me say that uh, I was instructed to read these books. <laughs> now I did uh, just open a page in one of them. And it's got a poem, which I think speaks to uh, some of what you were saying. And some of the questions that have been posed. No. The people are recording. Can you please bring your whatever things you need here? 
I know I don't want to go there. <laughs> because it becomes too much of a lecture. Please give me a Robin mic. Ah, there it is. Solution. You see, problem solved. <laughs> Thanks, a problem solved. Thanks a lot. And the poem says, uh, the sun, the sun, the sun set on us. When you came back home empty hearted, your words were hollow and your thoughts shallow. You had become a stranger a visitor in your own home. The child we all knew, the hero we raised, was absent in your face and had disappeared in your action. The sun set on us the day you came back to lead us. You became a stranger and a taker who cared little for those who waited patiently for your return. It's a very painful description uh, of the people who came back and became talkers and takers and cared little, cared little for those who waited patiently for their return. That's part of our problem. Uh, but before I come to the questions, you know, I, uh, uh, like all of us here, I'm sure not long ago, we listened to a, an interview on one of our national television networks. And the person who was being interviewed, uh, among other things, said uh, there are some of us in the country who call one another comrades. And he said this was embarrassing. Uh, so I was wondering what that meant. Uh, but he said it was embarrassing. And then he said, uh, the same people who call one another comrades, they use phrases uh, like lumpen proletariat. And he said, yeah, this is, uh, many people in the world are puzzled that words like this are still being used because the last time they were used was when East Germany, that's the word, the name he uses, but it means the German Democratic Republic uh, still existed. And so the rest of the world which interacts with us and we talk about loop and proletariat, they are wondering, where do these ones come from? And then he said, uh, one of the problems we have is that uh, the ghosts of Marx, Engels, Engels, and Lenin are still walking up and down the passages of Lutuli House. <laughs> Now, listening to this gentleman, I was saying, you know, uh, it reminded me of uh, an incident long time ago during the, the treason trial. Uh, the, the prosecutors brought an expert on communism to prove that the Freedom Charter and all of these things were communist. The Professor Murray. So, of course, he gives his evidence, and this is all communist stuff. And then, of course, he's then uh, uh, cross examined by the defense. And among other things, they then say 
uh, they quote some passages from books. Uh, they quote a passage. Now, Professor Murray, what would you say about this text? Uh, is it communist or not? It's uh, very communist. Then they quote him another text, same. Absolutely communist. And this one, very much so. Uh, and then the cross examiner said, but uh, Professor Murray, I've just uh, read to you three extracts from books. What would you say if I said all of these extracts are from your own books? <laughs> of course, Professor Murray couldn't answer this. So now I was listening to this gentleman talking about the course of Marx and, and Lumpen proletariat and so on. I thought he must have been a student of Professor Murray. <laughs> you know, the level of, he was uh, talking in a way which was very disturbing in this sense. Uh, this was somebody who was demonstrating the dangers of what the poet has called a little knowledge, being a very dangerous thing. Because clearly he doesn't know what he is talking about, but he thinks he knows, but doesn't. I'm saying that because we are here celebrating the 150th anniversary of this university which emphasizes the point that was being made by the Dean of the College of Education about the importance of learning. A major, major challenge on our continent is the production of this cadre, cadre of intellectuals. People who think, people who can produce new knowledge, people who can apply knowledge to the challenges that we face in order to achieve the advancement of our country and the rest of the continent. And we can't do that with a little knowledge. The challenge of the African school surely must be to produce this kind of person I'm talking about, this change agent. Change agent because you are empowered by the knowledge you've learned, the knowledge you've acquired, the knowledge that you are producing. I'm saying all of this in order to support Professor Vilm Komoye and our Vice Chancellor, uh, and indeed our Program Director, as we try to encourage everybody to join the African School, because indeed it is very focused on this matter. What is it that we do that we overcome this challenge of a little knowledge in order to produce this, these Africans, not South African, these Africans across the continent, who are able to be the kind of change agent that the continent needs very desperately. So I do hope that all of us, well, all of us, yeah, some of us were too educated to go to school again. Uh, <clears throat> but really to respond to this, because I think the African school, when the university, uh, Professor Vilkom and others here conceptualized this and uh, decided to establish it, it was really with this focus. What is it that we do in order to produce this cadre, this intellectual cadre, which our continent needs? And it's a, it's a particular responsibility, I think, that falls on the shoulders of this school and indeed the, the students as well. That uh, we, we are indeed an African university. And the expectation about the rest of the continent about what, what we might do. For instance, some of us would know that uh, for many years now we have been, uh, the university here 
uh, together with our foundation, have been hosting the, the Africa Day Lecture on the 25th of May every year. Now, our fellow Africans across the continent have been raising this thing for some time. That we're making a mistake in sensing, in, in behaving in a manner that uh, that Africa Day lecture is in a sense owned by the South Africans. That it isn't, it shouldn't be. It's an Africa, it's owned by the Africans. And therefore, an insistence that we can't always locate ourselves here. One consequence of that is that this year, uh, the Africa Day lecture will come, will be delivered from Conakry in Guinea. Uh, because the Guineans have said uh, we are ready to be the first to demonstrate that this is an, this is an African possession. I'm saying that Professor Vilnkomo to say, indeed, you are very correct to call this school an African school, because it is an African school. And so, indeed, uh, uh, please uh, do join the school because you would contribute, as I'm saying, to this cadre of intellectuals that the continent needs. And indeed, the rest of the continent expects that a school like this will make that contribution uh, to the continent as, as a whole. Uh, a Professor Kadata, did I choose the right poem? She says yes. She says yes. That poem speaks to the quality of leadership that Dr. Poe talks about. It talks about the quality of leadership and uh, makes very serious comments about some of us uh, who came back to the country with the people believing that we were heroes. And then we behave in a manner that proves that we are not heroes. Uh, I, I hope I understood, uh, I heard properly the questions that were being asked. Let me start with the last one because maybe it's the simplest. Question was about, there is corruption in the country and the serious. It is in government, and we want to fight it, we want to combat it. To whom do we report? The question arises because uh, the question I think is saying, whom do I trust that they are not corrupt? How do you report corruption to the corrupt? What's that going to do? Uh, I, I, there's a number of us here from the Tabombegi Foundation, uh, Seth Palazzi here, uh, Isia Gebel there, and I think some others. Muzi, uh, no, I shouldn't expose you. <laughs> Why don't you report to us? Tell us who's corrupt and then we'll act on it. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm really being serious about that. I'm serious about it because I understand. Working in government, for instance, you might be uncertain as to who is clean. And therefore, have this challenge. To whom do I report this so that we can combat this? I am saying one area, one place where you can report, I'm quite sure, uh, is our foundation. And we would act on the matter. Because indeed, we too are very, very, very concerned uh, to act on the matter of, of this corruption. There's an issue and question that was raised, and our colleague made a reference to the ANC document about the eye of the needle. And again, as I understood that question, uh, our colleague will correct me if I'm wrong, 
As I understood it, he was saying, the incest produced a, produced a document entitled The Eye of the Needle, which deals with the matter of the quality of leadership and raises questions of integrity, uh, of acting as a genuine representative of the people, of being selfless, and, and so on. The document exists, but he's saying the ANC is not behaving as directed by that same document of the ANC. What do we do about that? That's how I understood the question. An important question. Many of us uh, discuss this question and say, what is it that needs to be done? Indeed, so that the ANC behaves according to the documents and the policies it has itself produced. Now, with regard to this matter, which relates to the issue we're talking about that relating to corruption, yeah. If you look at uh, the political report presented by Nelson Mandela at the 1997 African National Congress National Conference, one of the things that uh, Nelson Mandela raised, main soul rest in peace, was that since we became, since the ANC became government, it has been attracting into its ranks a people who don't believe in its policies, in its values, but understand that this is now the, a governing party. And if I'm in it, the governing party, there's a possibility then I get into an official government position and do the stealing which our colleagues were talking about. That we are attracting into the ANC people who intend to use the, the ANC for corrupt purposes. Matter was raised by Nelson Mandela in that conference in 1997. The people who follow the ANC here would have read a document which drew a lot of attention, certainly within the ranks of the ANC, which was what was called a, di a diagnostic report produced by the then Secretary General of the ANC in 2017, Kwede Mantashe. Well, the reason it's called diagnostic is because it was trying to diagnose what's wrong with the ANC. And it came to exactly the same conclusions that Nelson Mandela had come to 20 years earlier. Now, if you look at uh, ANC official documents, from 1997 to 2017, they all say the same thing, which is that the quality the quality of the membership of the ANC is deteriorating. And therefore, that uh, you are accumulating within the ranks of the ANC, people who are bound to do wrong things. They join the ANC in order to steal. And therefore, they will steal. Uh, you can speak a million times about ending corruption. They won't end corruption. They will continue to be corrupt. That poses a challenge to the ANC itself. And fortunately, fortunately for the ANC, uh, today I'm not a representative of the ANC, so I'm not speaking for the ANC. I'm speaking as an observer. 
fortunately for the ANC, at its 2017 National Conference, it took a resolution on this matter relating to the quality of the membership of the ANC. And it said that the ANC needed a process of renewal and needed a process of renewal for its own survival. It didn't say just to correct things that are wrong. It said in order to survive, it must renew itself. Now, as I was quoting uh, what has been said in ANC documents since 1997 about the quality of the membership. I think it is logical. It is logical that uh, to renew itself, the ANC must look at the quality of these people who are members of the ANC who then end up like me as presidents and ministers in this and that and the other. Who are these people? Are they really ANC? Or are they like these people that Professor Tagata was talking about? Who became a stranger and a taker who cared little for those who waited patiently for their return. And so when the ANC must come to, to you, to Professor Lengabula here, and say, Vice Chancellor, we are the ANC renewed. <laughs> she must ask the question, why do you say that? In what way are you renewed? And the ANC must be able to say, we chased away Tabun Begi because it was corrupt. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> the ANC has an obligation to itself to go back to the people and present itself as a credible ANC. Mm -hmm. The ordinary people in our villages, in our townships, everywhere. They know these people who are called ANC members because they live with them. That this person who is the chairperson of the branch of the ANC, this one is a thief. They know that. So if I go here back to Professor Lengabula and say, here is an authentic ANC branch. And she says, this one led by a thief. It can't be. What I'm trying to say, a colleague, I was trying to ask this question about the eye of a needle and what do we do practically to make sure that it actually takes effect within the ranks of the ANC itself. I'm saying that uh, what the ANC itself has decided, which was repeated at this last national conference, this process of the renewal of the ANC must take place as a matter of urgency. Mm. ANC says it's got a membership of a billion plus. Quite why it needs so many members, I don't know. Because <laughs> uh, it doesn't. Hence the slogan which we borrowed uh, uh, from Lenin this ghost was walking up and down the halls of Lutuli House. When Lenin talking about something different, in then, in the, as the Soviet Union was born, he used the phrase, better, fewer, but better. Let's have fewer than a million, but better people who are true members of the ANC. That, that, <laughs> that would have a very, very serious impact on this matter of corruption, in combating corruption. To deal with these people within the ranks of the ANC, 
who are in the ends for wrong reasons. I'm saying that better, fewer, but better would help to answer some of these questions that are posed. The matter about gray listing, uh, I think we know that uh, globally there's been this very serious effort uh, to deal with problems of money laundering. Uh, related obviously to, to global crime. Uh, whether it's money which comes through drug dealing or the money is used for terrorist activities, uh, human trafficking, money is of this kind. Uh, because if you have this money in order to use it, you, you, you clean it, you launder it. You know, once, many years ago, I, I was still in, in, in government. I visited one of the European countries. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, there was a lot of discussion in that country, in their media, about crime in South Africa. Mm -hmm. High levels of crime and all that. So I decided, talking to this head of government, that I must address this question before he raises it. Uh, so I say, you see, we've got this problem in South Africa of crime. And then he stopped me, he said, no, wait, wait a minute. Let me tell you something about crime. He says, in this country, every single day, every single day, there's a hundred billion dollars worth of a uh, hundred million uh, worth of, it's a billion, uh, worth of drug money that is going through our economy, being laundered. So it'll pop up as shares in the respected companies. He says that scale of money laundering happens here in this country. So please, I'm sure in South Africa you don't have crime to that extent. <laughs> uh, I'm just pointing to the seriousness with which this matter of a global affair, money laundering was taken. And so indeed, therefore, uh, something called the Financial, Ex Financial Action Task Force was established which basically under the OECD. And one of the tasks of the financial asking task force, one is one of its tasks, is to monitor the incidence of this money laundering. Which means all countries are required to have particular legislation uh, and institutions, processes to deal with this matter. And in our case, we are part of that process. Uh, in our case, I, I don't know, I was told three, four, I don't know how many years back, that Financial Action Task Force alerted us to this problem and said, South Africa, there are certain deficiencies in your systems to deal with the matter of money laundering, like this and that and the other. Please attend to this. And we didn't. Which is what has led to the gray listing. Because in the end, they must then say, this particular country does not have enough of the measures to deal with this. So that you get labeled as a country that is, as a money launderer. That's very, got very serious negative consequences. Mm -hmm. Because then the global markets will deal with you as a money launderer. Mm -hmm. Well, you had the president, uh, Ramaphosa, responded to this and said, we will attend to this matter. <laughs> uh, I believe that was a serious commitment. It can't be other than a serious commitment. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> we, we have to deal with it. Uh, so it's, it's an issue. It's an issue which has been on our know, agenda for a number of years, but we ignored it. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully it will be dealt with. Uh, the, uh, the report, uh, the recent report issued by Palafal, not issued. Uh, the public protect, as I understand it, has not issued a report on the matter of Palapala, but posed some questions. Uh, two people were involved, first of all, in uh, complaining about the matter, like the DA and the AT and the ATM. Uh, and has said to them, in terms of our investigation, whatever, what is your view? It's not a, it's not a final report. Uh, it's an interim report. So these others have said, we'll, we will then respond to the request of the public protector to, to make an input about our own views. It's only after that that the public protector will, will produce a final report. That's our understanding. The public protector has made no determination. Uh, so the report that the public protector has cleared President Ramposa is incorrect. Uh, they are in the process of working on the matter and have said that when they receive these inputs from others, then they will prepare their final report. That is how, as I understand the matter. Uh, and indeed, that, that, that com communication of theirs uh, to, the, to the parties concerned, it leaked. It was not a public release. Uh, because they were not making any proposal to the, the public to engage the matter as the public protect. They were communicating to the people concerned. So I, I hope that we will will continue to treat it like that, that there's, there's no determination that's been made by the public protector on the matter. Uh, and indeed, obviously, the, uh, the, question, the, the question that our colleague raised about gray listing, he referred to Palapal. And that is correct, the reference. Because uh, the story was that there's a, a Sudanese businessman who lives in, 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 in Dubai who came to South Africa carrying lots and lots of cash in dollars, came through Oliver Tambo Airport, declared the money, bought buffaloes. And I'm sure all of us have heard this, that the, uh, the commissioner of taxes, and Mr. Kisbetter, have said there is no record of such monies being declared at Oatambo Airport. So that record doesn't exist. It's not been found. Uh, but there's no assumption to think that it exists, but has not been found. <laughs> uh, so it hasn't been found. And therefore, the, the suspicion arises naturally. This is this not part of money laundering? It arises naturally. Because uh, I, I don't know how much money I've owned at any particular time, but certainly never owned $580,000. And it's, it's strange, it's odd that the successful business person 
who's got that amount of money and can buy buffaloes, walks around with that kind of money as cash. <laughs> it's a strange concept. Uh, all of this emphasize, I mean, it, uh, it draws attention to this issue, to the question. Uh, we're not yet dealing with the problem of money laundering. So I'm saying that the colleague when he said uh, that this money laundering is a great listing business and is this pala pala thing not related to that. I'm saying that's a legitimate issue to arise. But of course, yet to be proved whether in fact uh, it is money laundering. The, uh, Our sister has raised the question about what she called territorial integrity and what's happening. I think she was talking about the, the war in Ukraine. Uh, and she and related this thing to, uh, was it, uh, uh, Professor Phil Como talked about right globalization. And I wrote here, fiat money. Uh, I think it's, it's clear, it's clear that uh, the conflict uh, in Ukraine uh, is in many respects a conflict between the U.S. and the Western countries against Russia. Uh, an important part of it, obviously, this is fact, has been uh, not only the supply of weapons to Ukraine by the Western countries, but sanctions against Russia. And so some of the, as we've all seen, uh, that effort to impose sanctions on Russia and have it isolated economically, globally, hasn't worked. Because countries like China, like India, many African countries, the countries in Latin America have not joined that boycott campaign. And part of what's risen in that context is a question that our colleague is raising, which is about the use of the dollar as an international reserve currency. It's, it's clear, this is part of what is happening, that many countries are saying, in order to avoid this consequence of the imposition of the sanctions by the United States, on the basis that you are using their currency in order to avoid the consequences of sanctions that arise from that, let's walk away from the dollar. And hence, the, there's a global discussion taking place yeah, about that. And it's, some of it is bilateral. Uh, when Russia trades with China, there's no re reason why they must trade US dollars to exchange, none. Yeah. I saw that even India is saying the same thing. So globally, there's a discussion that is taking place to say we must find alternative means of trading among ourselves and not subject ourselves to the situation where there's one, there's one currency in the world which becomes a global reserve currency because it gives the country that is the issuer of the money, that's the United States, it gives it the power to impose its will on everybody because you are depending on the dollar. So there is that discussion that is going on. I don't know where it's going to end, but I think one can see the logic of it. Well, one can see the logic of it. For instance, uh, Again, arising from that conflict, one of the matters that came up, that's come up very 
sharply is that many African countries depend on wheat, which comes from the Ukraine and Russia. Many African countries depend on fertilizer, which comes from Russia. And part of the problem with that, in the context of what we're discussing, is that if the African countries want to buy this wheat, they've got to buy it in dollars. But there are the sanctions which prohibit particular relations with Russia. So in the end, you say that we can't use this currency. So there's no alternative currency. And that's part of the part of the reason, only part of the reason, for instance, that the Russians have said that they appreciate the fact that there are many, many African countries who are going to suffer from very low yields of crops because of the absence of fertilizer, which is going to impact very negatively uh, on food security and then all of these issues. And therefore, they've said we are then ready to donate this fertilizer to the African countries. To avoid this obligation to be using particular kinds of money because the fertilizer is needed. So it's better that we as a country and the companies uh, just donate this fertilizer. And indeed, uh, uh, I might say this, that the second biggest uh, producer of fertilizer in the world is a Russian company. And they came to discuss this matter with the foundation. We discussed it with them to say it is very correct. The continent needs this fertilizer. And we can't use the obstacle of uh, a dollar or whatever to deny the continent this thing because it's really a matter of life and death for, for our people. So uh, the AU, fortunately, AU also in this last conference, uh, a summit, they took up the same matter. Uh, so hopefully the matter will be acted upon. Uh, I'm coming back to this matter, therefore, that I, again you have an instance here which says it is better that we had a, a diversified financial system rather than to be so tied up with one currency. Hence, what the, the, the conflict that is taking place in, in Ukraine has produced that particular consequence. Now, I don't know whether our government, we've got a colleague here who comes from government, whether they have been discussing this matter yeah. as to whether South Africa stands with regard to all of this. Yeah, because we're a big trading country. We're a very big trading country, and, uh, and the matter of uh, this reassessment globally about the global financial system would be a matter of direct concern to us. It should be. And when we do seek to make an input uh, with regard to that. The matter about uh, the, what do I think about the, is it section 194 process in parliament concerning the public protector? Well, I, I think the, uh, what we are having, what's happening in Parliament is something that uh, we, is born out of, it happens because of the systems we ourselves put in place. That you've got all of these institutions, con in constitutional uh, uh, institutions, like the public protector or the Auditor General or, or whoever. Um, these institutions facilitating democracy. There must be a process whereby if there's dissatisfaction with the performance of those institutions, 
protected as they are by the fact that they are constitutional bodies. There must be a way to deal with, if we want this person gone, what do we do? So things were processes were put in place to, to achieve that. So people have raised, parties have raised questions, questions about whether the current public protector is a fit and proper person to be a public protector. Whether that concern is right or wrong, I don't know. But matter has been raised. And fortunately, there are processes in place to deal with that. And I'm very glad, for instance, currently, as you saw, the public protector is presenting her own case to that committee. The evidence has been presented against her, which is negative. She's presenting her own case. And I think it's very good that she's able to explain herself and explain some of the things, critical things might, that might be said about her. So I think it's a healthy process. And needs, we need to allow it to take its course. And I'm quite sure that Parliament, uh, Parliament in the end will come to some determination on this based on what this particular committee will report uh, to the National Assembly in the end. To say, having had this and this and that and the other, on the basis of these facts, having listened to both sides of this equation, we recommend whatever to Parliament. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a proper process, and indeed a process we ourselves visualized, that it might be necessary, therefore you need in place certain provisions in the Constitution, in the law, uh, to, make that, uh, to make that happen. The question about the Afghan free, free, free trade area the continental free trade area. I wasn't quite sure uh, what the question was about this. Except to say that obviously, this is a very important decision, very consistent with uh, a view that the continent has taken about itself, its need for integration <coughs> and African unity. And therefore the need that uh, even in terms of the economy, it must integrate. So it's correct, very correct, that this decision was taken to have this continental free trade area. There are, there are obvious challenges which arise within the context of all of this. When you have a, a free trade area, matters like rules of origin, uh, the people are studying economics here will say that, the issue of rules of origin arises. Because uh, I am South Africa, I want to sell, serve, to sell a, a shirt to Professor Vilko Moye who comes from Botswana. Now, I can't have this shirt produced in some other country, literally. Then it comes to, I import it, and put a label, say, made in South Africa, mm -hmm. and then export it to Botswana, mm -hmm. a duty-free. He's entitled to say, uh -uh, that shirt is not made in South Africa. Mm -hmm. That's how the rules of origin thing arises. If you manufacture a car here, mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a colleague here used to sell BMW cars. <coughs> if, you, if you manufacture a BMW here, and you want to export it to the next African country duty free. Mm -hmm. The question arises, how much of that BMW originates from Africa? Mm -hmm. So the rules of trade will deal, the rules of origin will, will deal with matters of that kind. These are some of the negotiations that, that are taking place. But critical, critical to the success of a, a free trade area. is the production of goods and services among the countries in that free trade area. The production of goods and services which can then be traded. 
if I stay with this example, if uh, Professor Green Common here of Botswana it produces pineapples, and I produce pineapples, why should we trade pineapples? You need different products and services produced variously among these African countries in order to generate this trade. I'm saying that, colleagues, because the matter about investment in our economies becomes a critical part of the success of the free trade area. Yeah. Investment to be able to produce different products, different services. You would have noticed that uh, Nigeria was one of the last countries to sign up to this continental free, tra free trade area. Quite logical. Because if I'm Nigerian and I'm getting into this agreement, I look at a country like South Africa. As you know, that South Africa is going to be exporting to me many goods duty-free into the Nigerian market because they're already producing those things, which I'm not producing. Now, when I want to set up a, a factory, an industry to, to de produce those things, they will get overwhelmed by the imports from South Africa. And they, but there must be some way by which we protect our capacity to develop our own manufacturing. So I'm saying that is why Nigeria discusses it quite correctly, to say that you can't, you can't just open the doors everywhere because of and the inequality, the inequality among these African countries. If you take uh, what I think is a successful free trade area, is the European Union. The EU was faced with a similar challenge within its ranks. That if we want a genuine free trade area, we must kind of create a level, a level playing field. Which is why the EU had a very successful, what they call a regional policy, which entailed the transfers of capital and technology from the richer countries of the EU to the poorer countries, whether Portugal or Spain or Ireland, to make sure that they develop and therefore are able to trade on more equitable terms with the other member states. I'm saying this is a, a challenge that's going to face us on the continent, to make a success of the continental free trade area means necessarily there must be a process by which we encourage investment into our alternative uh, countries and therefore the diversification of our economies so that we, we have different goods and services to trade among ourselves. And that's an important challenge and I think as South Africa, as South Africa we need to be sensitive to that. Not just that these countries are now open to imports from South African products. But to say we are very interested as a country that these countries must also produce goods and services to export to us. And therefore that investment process becomes important. And thank you very much, Chairperson. I think I've answered all of the questions of the poll. <laughs> Give His Excellency another clap. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. I would like to acknowledge um, the executive members of the African Bar Association. They're here to prepare for the College of Law International Conference. Uh, would you like to put up your hand so that we can see you? If they're here. Have they come up? Oh, thank you. So we have got the president, uh, Hannibal Uwaifo, and the vice president, uh, Chief Ibrahim Mack. 
give them another round of welcome. And of course, we have got Professor Mana Manamela from the College of Law and Miss Matole. Thank you for coming. We really appreciate that. I would like to take uh, the final round of questions. Um, thank you, Your Excellency. I'm now going this side. I was this side, so let me give opportunity. Yes, oh, um, ladies, one, two, three, four, five. The one in gray, yeah. All right, please remember 30 seconds, no background. No. Come on, ladies. Okay. Or do you want to go first? These people have to go first. The one in pink, Okay. please go first. Just press. Okay, whoever ready, go first. Oh, hi, San Bonani, Geka Mangi Mutembi Sile, Mahua, I am a master's, uh, master of law candidate at the mighty university, uh, the University of the Land. Also a prospective student um, of the TM African School. Um, I'll try and be very brief. Uh, I believe in advoca advocating and the inclusiveness of Inclusive, inclusive approach when, when it comes to young people. As a young person sitting here, um, I can really confirm that we are going through a lot. Um, and I can, there's another one, it is Yakala. And in actual fact, Zikala Ngembela. And I know there's a jokingly connotation when it comes to Zikala, but when we look at the reality um, of young people in this country, Zikala. The acting executive dean of the College of Law said that um, we have lost who we are, and indeed we have done that when you look at the state of young people in this country. There's no way where you will go, where you'll walk, where you will not see the destituteness that African, young African people are in. We are engulfed in alcohol, in drugs, and that is our reality. Um, I, yeah, let me come to my question. Um, in ensuring that young people are not only left behind, but are part and are inclusive in the solutions that we have in this country, President, um, we have always preached, and this is something that continues and continues throughout the years, that um, youth participation and of youth participation and inclusion, however, it has always been a hypothetical or an imaginative um, Thing in this country, how do we move to the realization of young people at the front? And President, um, maybe if you can also just go back to when you were young, because you led when you were young as well. You're part of the ANC and part of the people that um, took us into this new dispensation. How then do we include the young people that are now left behind? Because we need to ensure that we are part of the solution and not the problem. We need to ensure that the young people that we see um, in the streets, Onyawube, we have now called them or labeled them, are not left behind. Um, yeah, they're cutting the president. Thank you. Thank you. Next. My name is Josephine Alexander. I'm a, um, an associate prof in the Department of English Studies. I have two questions, and then I have a book to give to the president for, <laughs> for being in Nigeria to um, oversee the election that has just ended. Thank you very much for all that you do for Africa. My first question is that in 2003, I happened to be in a school, United World College of Southern Africa called Waterford. And Helen Sussman was visiting. And as somebody who came from Nigeria where our nation has failed, the question I asked her is, how can we make sure, or what can be done that South Africa does not go the way of Zimbabwe and Nigeria. And her answer to me was that in South Africa, there is a very strong civil society 
and that South Africa will never go in either of those two countries. Um, my question then is, what happened to these civil societies in South Africa? How come that somehow they were not able to salvage the situation? My second question to you, sir, is the fact that you, you have spoken to us about the fact that the ANC needs renewal. And I want to ask, what role are you as what uh, Novalet Bulawayo we call ANC, ANC, that is the authentic ANC, and others who are still alive like you, like those who serve as ministers during Mandela, like Albi Sachs and all of them, what role are you playing in this renewal uh, process? What can you do to help us to make sure that this icon of an organization that was well revered all over the world can at least come back to itself and lead South Africa? And that maybe that would still be a beacon of hope to all of the African countries that are not sure of where we are going. Uh, those are my two questions. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and good afternoon to you, President. So um, having listened to everyone that was talking. Please uh, identify yourself. Oh, sorry. My name is Nzapo Majibi, and I'm the founder of Future Skills Lab, and I'm also an author. Uh, but what brings me here is sort of to get a sense from, for myself, I heard that some of the things that are important to president are people, um, institutions, and the economy. And for me, when I'm tying all of these things, uh, I see that people are the first thing that we need to consider when we are looking at everything that we do. So I, my first question is, uh, do you think that the renewal of the ANC will bring about a new vision for South Africa? or will they have new ideas of where the country is supposed to be heading? Because when we're li listening to them, we're not finding what is new that they, or what the vision of South Africa is. And then also my second question then says, um, do you also think that we will get out of the crisis that we find ourselves in, if you consider it a crisis? Then the last one, um, from former president to the future first female president of the republic, what do you think are the qualities I need to work on that South Africa need, and how does one get to cultivate those qualities as a young person that has future aspirations to be the change in South Africa? Thank you, President. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon or good evening. Thank you program director for the opportunity. My name is Mwegezi Mazaleni, a master's candidate in public affairs from Tswane University of Technology. My question to you, President, derives from your interview outside NASREC Expo Center 17 December, when you clearly and explicitly stated that the challenges that are faced by local government are are caused by the development of their financing. So my question to you, President, do, does local government in South Africa has adequate access to funding for them to effectively execute their developmental and constitutional mandate? A follow-up question on this question, is a professionalized local government a dream or reality? Thank you, President. Thank you. That's your research question, eh? yeah. And lastly, It was the, the gentleman in, in the oh, cream shirt. Uh, good evening, everyone, um, and honorable president. My name is Sipo Lukele. I'm a student of UNISA. My question is it's very simple. I just want to like for, to know from the president, what is the update regarding the Tabumbegi Presidential Library? Because I, I can't seem to find anything on it anyway. Thank you. OK. I'm going to allow one more question. 
I'm, we I'm have to allow His Excellency to, to answer. At the back, at the very back, the gentleman at the very back. <laughs> okay, order in the house. Order in the house. Let us have the gentleman at the very back, and then after the president has replied, we shall have another round. Right? <laughs> It's okay, yes. Okay. Please keep it short. No background. I will really keep it short. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, my, na my, my name is Martin Mande. I'm representing the South African Refugee Led Network. And my question is straight to DRC. DRC is going to the election uh, for next year. And we have a big number of IDP and refugees in the country. And there have been a uh, couple of. Uh, <coughs> peace process currently going through Kenya, and uh, we've seen all that group of people being isolated in the process. Now, South Africa, of course, has been a little bit championing the issue of process to under your leadership, and now it seems like it's very quiet, and we don't know what is the position of South Africa in the uh, DRC conflict currently. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are now going to allow His Excellency to reply. Then we shall have the last round. It's a, uh, according to my clock here, <laughs> it's 25 past five. Uh, When do we stop? <laughs> Not entirely up to you. Me, I'm ready to be until midnight. Uh, our, our, the program had said we finished at five. But in fact, we started this question and answer thing a bit late. That's what I thought we could must go beyond that five o'clock. But there must be an end somewhere. Maybe we might have to take a vote on it as to when we finish. That also has to do with colleagues. I'm raising it in part because I have to, I think I must be brief in my answers, which may not be very satisfactory. But the time element, I think, is, is an important one. To deal with the simplest one first, the uh, and the Tabombeki Presidential Library, it's, uh, it's discussing with the Johannesburg City Council uh, the various permits that are required from the city. Uh, already, the city has given a, a number of these permits that are required, but there are some outstanding ones. And we're hoping that uh, the uh, that might or might be, there are no problems in the sense of difference of opinion or anything like that. It's just, it's been availability of people. Uh, partly because, uh, as you know, uh, Johannesburg City has had too many changes of government. And when the change of government, you've got to start negotiating afresh and then all that. But the city is not a problem, city agrees. The outstanding, uh, I'm told, who are likely to c complete that process of talking to the city by next week or thereabouts, which would mean that we've got all of the necessary agreements from the city to, to begin construction. So the, the library will, this, will start the construction of the library this year as soon as all of those permission, matters of permissions have been approved by the Johannesburg City Council. Uh, the process of collecting material is continuing for the library, both from within the country and outside. For instance, the latest uh, material 
that will come into the library is President Kaunda's archive. So the Kaunda family and the government of Zambia have said that this material must come to the library here. So, so that process of collection is continuing. And the, the, the vice chancellor referred to this. This library, of course, works as part, we are part of the UNISA library. So working together with UNISA, and have now been joined by the National Library of South Africa as part of this process. So this is work in progress. It's, uh, it's moving, and I'm saying the only obstacles now have been thus just these licenses from the city, <clears throat> which arise really basically because this month you have a mayor, Mpegi, and next month is Mayor Ngomo, and, uh, which affects the, uh, the speed. On the DRC situation, I, I, really, I, I honestly do not know where our government is with regard to that. Uh, recently, I had a discussion with uh, a president Uhuru Kenyatta, uh, who, as you know, is the, the envoy of the East African community on the DRC. And that position has also now been endorsed by the African Union. So President Kenyatta is very concerned to deal with exactly the matters you are dealing with, you are raising. In the first instance, to help to resolve the conflict in the Eastern Congo. Which is why, together with Angola, they agreed with the M23 uh, for the ceasefire. And what will have to follow that, of course, not just ceasefire, but discussions between uh, the government of the Congo and the M23 to resolve the matter as of the very, what is it that led to the birth of the M23? And therefore, they resolve those questions which relates to uh, some of the populations, as you know, in the Eastern DRC, the Banyamuleng. Uh, but as I was saying that, uh, I, I'm not quite sure where our government stands on this, but I know for a fact that President Kenyatta, as that envoy, is very, very determined that uh, we must, they must intervene. Uh, in the Congo, as he is doing, in a manner that will also help in terms of the preparations for the next next elections. I, I don't, as I say, I really don't quite know where our government is with regard to this, but I'm sure, I'm sure they would be supporting the positions that uh, that President Kenyatta is uh, is taking. The matter about the youth, the destitute, destitute youth, and the challenges facing the youth, the matter is correctly raised. Uh, in reality, it's, uh, it's really about what do we do about with South Africa. For instance, with regard to the matter of its economy. We can't resolve the challenges facing the youth of all sorts, youth unemployment, access to education, and things like this, without addressing this fundamental matter of, of the fate of the South African economy. The, uh, during, during 2020, um, there was a very positive develop, development took place in the country in that uh, you had government, business, labor, civil society, everybody saying the problems of South Africa are so big that they need the cooperation of all of us. So government, business, labor, everybody, let's work together to find the solutions. Therefore, the need for a social compact. That was a very important decision, I'm saying, 
taken in 2020. And you recall that in, uh, in September 2020, the same year, the social partners produced one document to say, therefore, we are committed to act together to produce these outcomes. The problem that's arisen is that what they themselves, social partners, say who are ready and willing to act together in order to produce these outcomes, they are not meeting to produce those outcomes. And that's a serious challenge. I'll give you one example. The government and everybody else, the social partners have said, the matter about infrastructure investment is critical in terms of the recovery of the South African economy. Infrastructure investment. Now the agreement then is that government must produce these infrastructure projects to say here is an infrastructure project, A, to do whatever, and it's going to require so much money. So the government must produce these proposals about infrastructure projects. And the private sector has said, we have got the money to put into those projects. So we don't have to raise money outside the country. The problem is that the government has not produced the infrastructure proposals. In part because the government has been saying that unfortunately the government does not have the capacity, doesn't have the capacity to produce these project proposals. We've got to find a solution to that problem. Yeah. Because indeed, if you had that massive infrastructure investment, it would be a very important process of kick-starting this economy. Yeah. And therefore, creating the jobs even for young people. Creating the possibility for the training of people to fit into the jobs that are required by that resurrecting economy. All sorts of things like that. So, uh, as a foundation, we are engaging the social partners to say this agreement, this view that they took is very important and they must act on it. And hopefully, hopefully that will succeed. You would have noticed that uh, the president, President Ramaphosa, in the latest State of the Nation address this year, he committed the government to this point and said we're determined that the social partnership must work to produce this comprehensive social compact. It's critically important, colleagues, because uh, if you take public finances, government, it's clear the government is under a lot of stress in terms of generating the funds that are required to be invested in the economy and society. Lots of problems. Matters that Dr. Power is dealing with. If you look at the public state companies, they are all in crisis. Mm -hmm. So when you, you've got to be investing trillions of rand into this economy, where's that investment going to come from? Mm -hmm. I'm saying we're in a fortunate situation where the private sector says, in my lifetime, this is the first time I had this, 2020 where the private sector says, we are ready to invest those monies, because they've got the money. That readiness to invest in the economy has not always been there, but they're expressing it now. 
So it's very important that we act on that. I'm saying all of this to say, in order to be able to address the youth challenges, we need a situation in which the economy is developing. Anybody who goes around pretending that they can address the youth challenges outside of that context is not telling the truth. Yeah. Because everything costs something. Question arises, who pays? So hopefully, the, uh, so within that context, uh, if, let me, let's say, there's been a discussion in, this, we, in government for many years of building a dam on the Umzibum in Umzim Bobo River in the Eastern Cape. We've been talking about that matter for forever. And the dam is necessary in that area. It's possible. Supply water, generate electricity, whatever. To this day, there isn't a concrete project proposal to say here is a concrete proposal for the Mzimbubu Dam. This is how much it's going to cost. And so you, people who've got money, please invest. And they are standing there saying we've got the money, we want to invest. Where is the project? If you did that, you would then know Look, if the Zimbabwean dam is like this, this project, what kind of skills is it going to need? In what numbers? And therefore, taking care of the youth, therefore, why don't we train the youth in those particular skills so they can become part of this project? I'm saying you can only address the, the matter of the youth, which is raised very correctly within that larger context. So we've got a bigger context of addressing this particular challenge. Uh, to meet what President Ramaphosa said, even in the latest State of the Nation address, that as a country we've got a responsibility to make sure that the social compact takes place. Because it's going to require a lot of, this economy is going to require a lot of money to invest in it in order to make it grow. And if, if we're expecting external investment to come in, uh, why do we allow gray listing? We ignored the warnings that were given to us to please do, do the following so as not to be gray listed. We ignore all of that. Gray listing comes. Now, we expect somebody to come from the rest of the world to invest. They are going to say, but I'm not going to invest with money launderers. <laughs> it's a particular challenge, and clearly the government and the other social partners must address this matter seriously. <laughs> so you, somebody was asking a... Uh, uh, what are you people like me? What are you doing about this AIDS renewal? What are you contributing? In part, to answer that question, uh, this is exactly the kind of question that we are raising, some of us. That you, you, can't, you can't make this economy grow in the way that it has to grow and develop, by producing wish lists. <laughs> wish lists are very, very easy to do. I can produce a book of 200 pages of wishes. It will not produce the change that we want. And so if there are business people who say, as they say, as they have said, business community, yeah, we are ready to invest a trillion rand 
in the South African economy over a period of three years. I say to people, that's the first time in 2020 I heard private business say that since 1994. I don't know what, what, what changed. Since 19, it was the first time since 1994 that the private sector would make a commitment of that kind. And a trillion rand is not small money. Some of us would not know how to pronounce it. <laughs> Why are we as government let that commitment pass by? True. So that some of what that some of us, the older ones, are trying to insist on with regard to the government. That the government has to do things, it must act correctly on this matter. True. And act in a in a very concrete way. Act in a very concrete and specific way. As I say, not, not, not just to express wishes and hopes. Mm -hmm. uh, and that relates also to the matter that was raised about ANC renewal. And the advantage some of us have is exactly that we are older. And therefore, we know, we know of a different ANC. Not, not an ANC that was identified by corruption. You know, I spent, uh, I can't remember now, 20 years plus uh, in Zambia. Now, as, uh, as members of the AIDS in Zambia, we depended on uh, what was called supplies, which meant uh, there was a logistics place there. And one twice in a year, they would come to come and you select clothing. The second hand donated clothes. Uh, but every, every week, they give you a piece of paper to go and buy meat in a particular butcher in Lusaka. It specified how much meat you are allowed uh, in a week. So we're depending on supplies like that. Quite late, uh, they decided to give us uh, uh, a month, 14 kwacha cash. Now with 14 kwacha, you would be able to buy maybe three bottles of beer. <laughs> and that's the end of your money. Well, or, or go to the cinema plus one, one bottle of beer. So that's the end of 14 quarts. The consequence of that, comrades, is uh, yeah. we come back here, yeah, home, in 1919. So we're working at ANC headquarters uh, at Shell House. So the ANC gives us an allowance. Uh, I know an allowance to buy two beers, three beers. But this one they give me is a bit bigger than that. Mm. And I don't know what to do with it. Mm. So I gave it to my wife. That's, uh, I've never had a bank account. Mm. I don't know what it looks like. A credit card, I don't know what it looks like. Mm. It's because each time I don't drink beer now. I will. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got to go to Mrs. Mbeki each time I want to buy something. Uh, fortunately, she's kind enough to <laughs> assist. I'm sure that's a practical thing. It arises from the fact that we lived quite happily in Lusaka without money. Somebody else was managing our lives in terms of that. So you get used to it. So since then, I've never known how to handle money. I'm saying, therefore, you, we know of an ANC, which was very different in many respects. 
from the end of the day. And therefore, the question I just posed, what you older people, what are you doing about this renewal, renewal mat? Is exactly to bring into the ANC that kind of experience. That the ANC is not like this. Our colleague from Nigeria, I think, was saying the real ANC, ANC, ANC. Yeah. That's part of what we bring into this process. Whether they are listening to us, I don't know. We've got a very important member of the National Executive Committee of the ANC present with us here in the meeting. Mdu uh, Ndoli, uh, who's sitting in front of me here. I don't know, Mdu, are you listening to us? <laughs> The, uh, our, <laughs> he, sa he, said, he said yes. Uh, a colleague asked about uh, what happened uh, in this, this strong, civil society, strong civil society that was promised. Yeah. What happened? Because indeed South Africa went the wrong route. Uh, I think I've dealt with that question that one of the fundamental issues is the, the deterioration in the quality of the membership of the ANC, which was a governing party, which still is. That deterioration in the membership has an impact not only on the ANC, but necessarily on society because we are dealing here with a governing party. And that affected civil society also. In practical ways, you could say, for instance, that uh, you could see what happened that uh, in this country, before 94, the rest of the world, because of involvement in the struggle against apartheid, did a lot to support civil society with funds and all of that. So we had a very thriving civil society, in part because it had that strength, resource strength, because of the rest of the anti-apartheid world assisted. 1994 came, and those resources dried up for civil society, because now the rest of the world said, now you've got your own government. Ex support yourselves. You saw that what has happened over the years has been a, a decline in the strength and, and capacity, acti activism, and so on of civil society. That's one of the reasons, not the only. But I'm saying at the center of it was the weakening of the ANC. And therefore, the, the consequence that you were worried about, that the, the South Africa itself began to develop some of the negative consequences, characteristics that we've seen in other countries on the continent. Here we can only change that by changing the ANC. And fortunately, I'm saying the ANC itself in conference says we must change ourselves. That change the matter of a new vision for South Africa. The things that we say take South Africa out of its crisis are the things I'm talking about. We've, one of the things that must happen in order to take this country out of its crisis is to take the economy out of crisis, mm. to generate the resources that you all need. I'm quite certain that we need to have a look at the financing of local government. Because it doesn't make sense to have a, a municipal council in some rural area, African rural area, and expect it to generate resources to be able to do anything. They can't. 
they need resources from elsewhere in the country. There's a very important proposal. Uh, we're discussing this with some colleagues, some comrades yesterday. A very made, important proposal made by the Presidential Economic Advisory Council on this same matter. That, for instance, where you have the Development Bank of Southern Africa, the DPSA, which is one of the main funders of local government, that the DPSA should stop funding the metropolitan municipalities. Because the metropolitan municipalities have capacity to raise funds. And they do. The other municipalities don't have that capacity. And therefore, that the funds that the DPSA is able to mobilize must go to these other municipalities that don't have the capacity to raise their own funds, away from the metros. And therefore, that even the idea and the practice of the district development model is important. If, in fact, you then use that district, you use the district as a real instrument for change in the district in which it is, impacting on the local municipalities. For that, it needs funds, the district. And therefore, that the DPSA, part of what needs to happen is that the DPSA must shift its resources to those districts which have no capacity to raise funds. So when you talk about what do we do with the local government, that's part of what you need to do is to look at the funding the funding formula for local government. Is it the right one? I suspect it isn't. But, it, but then, of course, as a consequence for that, once you say, we must then make sure that there are these larger resources available at local government level in those areas, you've got to answer the question, do those municipalities have the capacity to look after those funds correctly? to make sure that they are not looted, to make sure that they are used for the purposes that are intended. That's an intervention that has to be made in local government to develop that kind of capacity. Even just to look after the additional resources you must put in there. So it is possible. It is possible to restructure local government in that way. <laughs> The political parties have got another question that they must answer. That the people they put into local government must be people who are honest. Be people who are really dedicated to, to serving the people. You know that the, uh, the law, the law, yeah with regard to local government, provides for the establishment of, of ward committees. Mm -hmm. And describes how they should function and what, how they should be composed. Yeah, I'm sure you can go across the country now, today, tomorrow. I don't know to how many such ward committees you'll find which are functioning properly. Very few. So the capacity of the communities to have oversight of their own council is not there. I'm saying these are elements that you need to attend to in order to build the kind of government you need at local level so that the municipalities, local government becomes effective. Again, it's a detail, it's a matter of detail of practical detail. I'm saying the political parties must answer the question. Uh, who are these people they are putting into local government? You have, I'm told, you have councillors. Councillors who can't read and write. 
And so when the council has to meet as a report that is prepared by the municipal manager, they can read it. And so what contribution are they going to make in terms of municipal government? The ANC, uh, the members of the ANC here would know that. The ANC has established a, a political school, the Oliver Tambo Political School which there, it's got a, a proper courses uh, for people to follow. And so you can do so many modules and you get a certificate to say that you've studied these issues, you've understood them. It helps you in your political development yeah. as a member of the ANC. When uh, the, 19, the last the local, local government elections took place, were held. The ANC took a very important, correct decision to say it must, it must put in place a process <laughs> to vet yeah. the people that it was proposing as mayors. Put together in place that process. So indeed, the ANC in Johannesburg a region would come and say, this a short list of three people. So these are the one of these three who can be mayor of Johannesburg. So the committee would then have a look at that and interview the three people and decide which one of these is the best to be a mayor and then say, look, so and so this is the person that we should put forward as a proposal for a mayor. You know what happened, the colleagues, in that process? So some of these teams are interviewing uh, these candidate mayors. I come there as a candidate mayor, and I produce this uh, certificate I've got from the Oward Tambo School which shows that I'm qualified in this. I'm really a good cater of the ANC. I'm educated in this politics. And then the team that is uh, interviewing these candidates, they ask me questions about the subjects I've studied. And I can't answer. <laughs> what they found, <laughs> was that what's happening is that uh, <clears throat> I speak to Spusiso Vinkomo here. I say, Spusiso, please do me a favor. Please go and study at the Oat Tambo School in my name. <laughs> so he studies at Tambo and really studies, and he qualifies. And they give him this thing. So when, as a candidate mayor, I'm producing this thing, uh, it's him who started for me. Mm. And that's why I can't answer the questions. Mm. I'm talking about something that was happening now at the end of 2021. Mm. I'm, that's why I'm saying the parties must really be serious about the matter. Who are these people that they are putting in the local government? It can't be these people who, who pay, I'm told it's 5,000, 6,000 rand that they pay. So I owe, I owe Professor Bill Komoye 5,000 rand because he did, he did it for me. Yeah. You, you can't have those people in local government, particularly in a situation where you, 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 you introduce there's larger resources which local government needs. You are opening the space for looting. But are our parties, including the ANC, are they sensitive enough to this thing? Who are these people that we're putting into local government? I know, I know in some instances where 
the people who are putting government are actually criminals. But they are labeled as these are members of the ANC and all that. So the new vision, the new vision that must come from the ANC out of the crisis, get country out of crisis, has to do with dealing with these very practical matters. What do we do about the economy? What do we do about local government? As the economy changes, what practical measures are we putting in place? to deal with the challenges of the youth. These are all practical things that need to be answered. Yeah. That's where the new vision must, must come from. Yeah. So I've dealt with the matter there of local, the local government definitely needs for new funding, but also needs other things. Yeah. It must be possible. It must happen that we do indeed have a professional, a professional public service. The ANC started discussing this thing quite a long time ago, 2005, 2006. That we had, uh, between 1994 and then, the country had stabilized, and therefore it was now possible to produce uh, a professional public service. And steps were taken at national level, even then. They got disrupted because of uh, the ANC's own challenges, that process. But it has to happen, uh, and it is certainly possible. Okay. The, uh, the qualities that... Uh, what qualities must people develop uh, in order to be able to make their own positive contribution, including to play a role as leaders? Uh, I, I think there are really these two qualities that we're looking for. It's really a, a real, genuine commitment to serve the people of South Africa. It's a genuine commitment to serve the people of South Africa, not yourself. And certainly the capacity, the capacity to be able to, to do something to help to bring about that change. So that you, you, you express, you engage with the challenges of the country in a way that actually produces change. That's why at the beginning I was raising the matter about this particular school, this African school. And it is important in terms of the producing the change agents. A commitment to serve the people and the capacity to serve the people. That's basically what, what, what one needs. And of course, a, a courage enough uh, mm -hmm. to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It could courage enough to say, Comrade President, you are wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, and the kind of honesty such that, uh, you know, as a comrade of mine, uh, quite old, used to make a joke a few years back <laughs> when people in government uh, would uh, say something, even in a private con conversation, he would say jokingly, a comrade, you must be very careful about what you say because it might be career limiting. <laughs> I'm saying this the quality, one of the qualities we're talking about is not, not to behave like that. Mm. I can't tell the truth because it might be career limiting. Mm. And I think you find a lot of that, mm. certainly in our government. Mm. And people who behave in very strange ways. I think I know Professor Langabola here. <laughs> I know her very well. 
But suddenly she's behaving in funny ways. <laughs> Only to discover that it's career limiting that she's avoiding. <laughs> no, 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 and it's not, I'm sorry, not really. <laughs> not, not you. But I'm saying this at the college, it's really we need. Yeah. And you know, and the interesting thing, I'm sure as all of us know, the ordinary people, they know that, they can sense it. That this one is really interested in our welfare. So it doesn't matter how loud you sing and you toy toy and all these things. If you don't have this quality, the people will know that that one is just a singer and dancer. Yeah. I think I've answered all the questions. <laughs> The last one. Last one. Go to ten past six. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Please give our Excellency. I would like to apologize because of the time. The good news is that we have got another engagement in August with His Excellency. Okay. So, those of you who have not ask your question, I'll, I'll give you opportunity next time, in August, because we really must allow him to, to leave. But before His Excellency leaves, may I ask uh, our photographer to, to, to be ready, because we want to take a photo with His Excellency in front here. And before he does that, please allow me to call uh, Mr. David Reswalo to give the vote of thanks. Have you forgiven me? Because I cannot really allow more questions. Uh, program Director, Professor Esther Kebuka Sibitosi. I thank you for inviting me to the podium. And please allow me to first and foremost extend my greetings to former president and chancellor of this 150-year-old university, His Excellency President Tawambeki. And also the vice chancellor and principal of this very same elephantine and behemoth of education, Professor Buleng Lenkabule. Members of the UNISA Council present here, management and staff of UNISA, unions, students, all colleagues from the Tabambeki Foundation, as well as colleagues from sister universities and other entities, and in particular the African Bar uh, Association. Our esteemed, highly esteemed in particular, the members of the Dipl Diplomatic Corps present here this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, Galatamish. Ladies and gentlemen, this acknowledgement extends to everyone virtually connected to this event across the country, the continent, and the globe via the various media platforms. Program Director, I once again thank you and all the organizers of this elegant, educative, and highly conversational event of UNISA's Tawambeki African School of Public and International Affairs, the TM School, for the opportunity to render this rather deceptively simple item on behalf of the management of the school. For indeed, it's a difficult and complex task which those of you who think that they know English would justifiably say it is a Herculean or a mammoth task. <laughs> its complexity lies in that it is a nakedly predictable exercise. That is why it's called vote of thanks. <laughs> Program director, thank you again 
for steering this ship with such exuberance and stellar disposition and underscoring the objective of this event as seeking for wisdom rather than mere information. Therefore, allow me to specifically thank the Executive Dean of the Tabon Big African School of Public and International Affairs, Professor Velen Komo, for eloquently reminding us of UNISA's 150th year celebration as a milestone. Prof Nkomo, you, you impressed upon students to have the quest to build societies that work. And you also shown the, the spotlight on the values and track record of President Mbeki, and in particular his role as a peacemaker, not only on the continent, but also the rest of the globe. And I want to appreciate the fact that you emphasize the notion of African Renaissance. Madam Vice Chancellor, uh, the TM School registers its most sincere gratitude for always pushing yourself to create time in your busy schedule and, t and, and teacher schedule as a leader of this gigantic university to honor our invitations and request to attend our events whenever you are called upon without complaining, I dare say. You have to teach us where to get such stamina. <laughs> and I'm not surprised that uh, the program director called you a, a woman of substance. Mr. Chancellor, I have learned that in West Africa, particularly in Ghana and uh, Nigeria. There is an expression presciently articulated by the Igbo people of Nigeria that says, and I'm going to attempt it. Or, all this means that the child who washes his hands eat with kings, or if a child washes his hands can eat with kings or the elders. Similarly, in the language of Batavine, we say, this is thus to register our sincerest gratitude for the sagacious contribution you continue to make as an elder. And it is therefore a matter of appropriacy that we, like a child who washes his or her hands, continue to benefit from being in your presence and drinking from the well of your wisdom. On this issue of children and elders, and even this expression, the program director and the three speakers we have here today pick this powerful signifier quite impressively. The program director used the expression of we are sitting at the feet of wise people. And she further repeatedly associated you with wisdom. And, and therefore this qualifies you to be an elder. And Professor Markwe referred to the concept of a village and directly referred to you as a village and that we are going to be eating from the village. And indeed, we did eat from the village this afternoon. Professor Chakata's uh, poem, I think speaks to this notion, although in a very, very deep and painful way. And I also see that Dr. Boy used the idea that we are, and I want to quote him, we are appreciating the elders. So as we praising the past. So Mr. Chancellor, 
you have really positioned yourself as an elder. That is why you keep on saying, we are the cadres and then the change agents or agents of change. And which speaks to critical students who should play a constructive role in the transformation and development of our continent. So Mr. Chancellor, thank you so much for all effortlessly answering all the difficult questions raised by all of us in this house and thereby sharing your wisdom. Thank you so much indeed. I return to Professor Markwe, Dr. Bowe, and Prof. Jakarta. We thank you for generously donating your time and insights in making sure that this conversation with President Mbeki indeed becomes truly dialogical and highly engaging for all of us, especially our students. Finally, I want to thank all, all of you, all the participants and attendants here for the pragmatic and critical questions that got President Mbeki to, to speak and thoroughly engage. So colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, even those who are on virtual platforms, please let us give a deserved round of applause and gratitude to all of us for attending this session and really making this a magnificent success that it has been. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of this function. We want to thank you for everything. Siabonga Gakulu. Asante sana. Now, because of protocol, please remain seated. I would like to ask His Excellency and to come to take a photo. We must capture these moments. The speakers as well, the three um, speakers, please. And then we shall allow His Excellency to go first after our pictures. All right, that will be followed by His Excellency, the ambassadors, and then the rest of the staff. Thank you so much. Please be patient, just one minute. Uh, protocol, protocol, yes, yes, yes. Just security, you know, to give the, yes, she can approach. Okay, thank you. Okay, you want us to come down here? All right. As people are coming, I have a, a staff card for Swanapu. Pick it from me.